reframed a lot of them for this exhibition. currently have 15 people who are um, who have joined the meeting and uh, I suggest that now maybe everyone mutes themselves and um, then uh, what we will do is first of all I want to thank everyone for taking part in this meeting this is the first uh, zoom meeting that I'm hosting and also this is the first exhibition after the lockdown that we are currently having in uh, our gallery and also it is the first artist talk that i'm hosting for the camera club i would like to introduce well most of you know but those who don't uh, dan bachman dan can you show yourself can you unmute yourself and say hello please hello everyone i'm dan and i think i do know most of you but it's a yeah. pleasure my way around and see more of you again. Um, I've asked Dan to do so because he will be co-hosting today with me so if I'm stumbling and all forget words or forget the buttons he will be giving me his strong and wise hand and saving my life. Um, thank you Dan. So hello everyone and hello Wendy. Wendy where are you? Say hello yourself please. Hi, hi everyone. Hello Wendy. Uh, and again, I just want to say a big thank you to Wendy that she has agreed to be so brave and uh, really uh, have a wonderful, wonderful exhibition at the gallery being first person after the lockdown. It is really, really brave. I know Wendy for quite some time and originally we met at Photo Fusion, I think, with Wendy on one of the yeah. wonderful, yeah. Yes, wonderful uh, Saturday sessions when all photographers meet and we discuss different projects. And I just took liking to Wendy uh, the first glance. It was on my behalf, on my part, it was a first sight love. And uh, then uh, we, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, uh, creative love, <laughs> photographer's love. And uh, I followed uh, Wendy's um, adventures in the world of photography. And I was uh, lucky to, uh, see some of her projects uh, somewhere on the go, then some she came presented when they were finished for those Saturday sessions. And uh, I just um, could not not invite her to be a member of the club and finally, finally, to have some of her wonderful uh, work on our walls. And um, I just want to say a couple of words and then I will take. Um, I pass it on to Wendy because she prepared um, something for us today. So I will pass on to her in a second. And before I do, I just um, want to say that this is a very interesting project and it is related to Second World War. And may I say to your father, who was a veteran of Second World War and who took part in that Burma campaign. And uh, uh, correct me if I am not correct uh, that was the uh, original uh, something that uh, initiated that uh, project and um, i think that wendy will tell you herself but when i learned about how she did this project and how much effort she put into it i was just in complete awe and from that moment on i want to pass you on to wendy uh, who will be presenting her uh, thoughts and talk uh, to you and then uh, I will be monitoring some time. I don't know, Wendy, for how many minutes are you expecting to talk? Um, About 20. 20 minutes. 
So, uh, great. So, and after that, uh, it will be a question time. Um, so, let's see how it goes. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so, I'm just going to now share my screen. and start my presentation. Okay, all right. Can I get a thumbs up that you can see that, please? Peter? Yeah, I can see Brilliant. that. Brilliant, thank you, thanks, Dan. Okay, um, well, Kate, thank you so much. Um, I've got several thank yous, as you had several firsts. Thank you for uh, introducing me. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to put my work up and actually it's really exciting. I know originally it was planned for during lockdown, but to be the first exhibition um, <coughs> after lockdown um, is terrific. Really, really good. Thank you very much for that. You almost um, and thank you for asking me to talk about the work um, and, and hi everybody. Um, so um, as a photographer, I'm interested in people and nearly all of my work revolves around people in some way. In this particular instance, it, it is photographing people, people with a particular uh, background. Um, and other times it's photographing other things in order to portray people or perhaps trying to express something about the human condition of, about stages in life. What I'd like to do, the body of work that's in um, Gallery 1885 is an edit of my Burma Veterans Unforgettable and it is of the UK-based veterans from the war in Burma in World War II. Um, and I'd like to start by showing you a short film, not by me, it's a Pathé News film um, from 1944. It's just under three minutes. Um, it is a little bit jerky probably across the internet, but do, do please um, bear with me on that. Um, so, these are some of the pictures up in the gallery. As you can see, they're not war pictures, so don't get put off by the fact that I'm showing you war footage. Um, but the people that are in the exhibition and in the project all had the same common background. And so this really is to give a very small flavour of their common background. In the tangled Burmese hill country of Vatican, the 14th Army fights against the forces of Japan and the forces of a cruel country endowed with a killing climate. Never in the history of warfare has supply presented so difficult a problem as here. In a country not fit to live in, several hundred thousand ordinary men from Cardiff, Liverpool, Manchester, London, Australia and India who have become known among themselves as the Forgotten Army do the seemingly impossible campaigning that would break the hearts of lesser men. Here in pictures is what Frank Owen styles that marvellous sense of duty and loyalty to their comrades, allied to a feeling that they will not let the army down. Here's another angle of the Burma front, the sheer perverse geography of the place. Observation posts to look out on a confusing billow of hills, each tree and clearing of which has got to be covered. If it's difficult to watch, it's hell to foot slog through. It's trackless jungle dripping with disease. The hot steamy air soaks into the men's bodies. They gasp for breath in the rarefied air at these alpine altitudes. Khaki tunics change color. They become black with sweat. Then there's the grim fight to keep body and soul together. Shelter for the night is a few flimsy tents perched on a hillside. Every box of supplies must be hauled up the long, weary climb from the foot of the hill. Water must be passed from hand to hand from the only available spring. Somehow, 
men ready to drop from exhaustion, get their food. And the most insidious enemy of all is the rain. At long last, someone is putting a foot down on the SEAC publicity accelerator. Chances are brighter of our getting bigger and better film and press reports from Southeast Asia. The prodigious feats being performed by the Imperial 14th Army will live for all time. Um, so, of course, not all the people out there were on the ground. Um, there were all areas of the forces. There were people up in the air. There were people on, in the seas and the rivers and so forth. But I, I thought it was um, worth showing you that. And then fast forwarding 71 years from when that film was made to um, an exhibition I went to see uh, in Tate Modern. Now, Kate, you're completely right. My father was in Burma, and so I had always known about Burma. Um, a lot of people didn't talk about their uh, experiences there, but but my father did. But the um, the interest, therefore, and the trigger was a combination of that and the fact that I went to this really excellent exhibition. I don't know if anyone else went to see it, but um, the premise of the exhibition was that the first room you went into was photographs taken seconds after something had happened in the conflict. And the next room was minutes after, hours after, days, weeks, etc. So we've got Dresden seven months later and Nagasaki 18 years later. Uh, there were portraits, there were landscapes. It was a really interesting exhibition. And when I came out, I realized that there was nothing in there about Burma. Um, now that's not unusual. Um, the, the Forgotten Army is what they were called. Um, I was used to that, but this somehow it got under my skin this time. Um, and I thought about it a lot on my way home. And by the following morning, I determined that in my own small way, perhaps I should be doing something about it too late for that exhibition, but uh, I determined that I would find all the veterans that I could in the UK who'd been out um, during the Burma War and photograph them. So that's what I set out to do. Um, I approached, first of all, two organisations that had members who'd been out in Burma. So it was the Burma Star Association and the Association of uh, Chindits, uh, old, uh, not quite sure what it's called, Old Comrades Association, I think it was called, um, to start getting names from them, people to approach. And the first person they put me in touch with um, was John Giddings. Um, John was the chairman of the Burma Star Association and a great person to start with because he could open quite a few doors to me. Um, other people I found, each person I met, I'd asked, do you know one, anyone else? There were regional groupings of the Burma Star Association, so I managed to get in touch with the people who'd been in, in charge of that, and they had lists and they would contact people for me. Um, one or two people put uh, adverts in local papers, so it was a, a sort of mixed way of finding uh, these veterans. Um, and in the end, I photographed over 200 um, both in the UK and out in Burma, or as it is now Myanmar. I'm, I'm not showing those, I'm just showing the UK ones in Gallery 1885. Um, so each person I met, I took uh, an informal picture of, usually uh, an environmental portrait, sometimes a little bit more close up, and for those people who still like to put on the blazer, the medals, sometimes the, the beret or the bush hat or whatever, I would take a slightly more formal portrait. So obviously that's John Giddings' more formal portrait. Um, this is Derek Licorice in Inverness and that's his informal portrait. Um, and of course, a lot of people didn't do the, the whole uh, medals thing uh, anymore. Although they all had, um, uh, and the other thing I did was I photographed their memorabilia. So a lot of people had kept things from their time uh, out in, in Burma and India. And despite 
several moves of house, some of them in care homes, they still, most of them had something. Um, I don't quite know how he got these tools back. Uh, this is Bill Smiley's um, tools, one of them for digging out slip trenches. They weren't really allowed to bring souvenirs back, so a lot of them put them down the, their trouser legs, so that's probably what he did. Um, and although I've talked about the common background of Burma, that's why I was photographing them, um, they'd all led very, very different lives um, since. And I would set up a, a two hour session with them and talk to them, let them talk to me about their experiences, about their life. I wasn't there to interview them, but of course, as uh, I'm sure you know, you get a better portrait if you've got to know something about someone and they feel more relaxed. Um, I've got a story for each of them that they've told me. I've got my own stories about most of them. Um, I promise not to tell you about all 200 though, because that would be a bit long, wouldn't it? So um, this is uh, Stanley. He's my poster boy, I think, really, for, for the work. He, worked, he lived in Slimbridge um, at the time and was in the Royal Engineers. Um, this is Sid Slingsby. I think he looks like a fisherman. I mean, he wasn't a fisherman, um, but that's what he looked like. Um, he was in the, the Royal Artillery. So I went all over the, the UK. Uh, my most northerly point was the most northerly point. This is Duncan from Thurso up in Scotland. I went to the Isle of Man, had a great trip to the Isle of Man. Um, James Fenton had taken his camera, or at least he had his camera sent out to him. He weren't really allowed to have a camera out there, but he used his camera. You can see, hear a little bit more about him or read a bit more about him on my Instagram feed um, because I, I talked about him a little bit. But this is the camera he had with him out in Burma. Um, went to the West Country, went to the Isle of Wight. This is Max Aitken from the Isle of Wight. His, his real name is Harry, but in the war he was known as Max. And so he wanted to be labelled as such for the project. Um, he was in the Navy. And I went to school on the Isle of Wight. He lived at the bottom of the road where my school was, which was very strange, not a school I liked. Um, and we worked out that his son had been at the school at the same time as my older brother. I found two women, only two women. There were women out in Burma. This lady, Theo Morris, uh, she was a ward nurse. I photographed her in her home in Portslade. What, one of the biggest challenges of the project actually was arranging the appointments with them in the most effective way so that I did trips as efficiently as I possibly could. Um, uh, she married Colin Morris, who was out in Burma. Uh, Colin was with the East Lancashire Regiment. And each time I rang and booked, one of them had just gone into hospital. And as one came out, so the other one seemed to go in. So it was quite tricky to, to set up my meeting with her and with them. Um, but eventually it seemed to be okay, so I went down and rang the doorbell and she, she came to the door um, in her nightdress and she had forgotten, um, that's okay, but she really felt it wasn't, wasn't a good time for me to be photographing them, but it had taken quite some time to set this up. So we chatted a bit and I can't quite remember how it came about, but I went in and I changed a light bulb for her um, and I made her coffee and um, we, we, we broke the ice and she said it was okay. And she went up and put this beautiful dress on. You can just see her night dress underneath by her feet. I hope you can see that clearly. Um, and then Colin got up and she persuaded him to get dressed. And so um, I saw them both. Okay, I think because I've admitted someone, it doesn't want to, oh, there we go. Um, and this is their memorabilia, that's their wedding photograph that they had. This was the oldest of the veterans that I photographed. This was the Brigadier Rupert Crowdy. He was 105. 
and I came across him purely by chance. I was buying lunch in a supermarket because uh, he lives he lived in Burford. I live in Oxfordshire, so it's not that far away. And the paper had that little banner on the top of the, the front page saying veteran of a, a veteran celebrates 105th birthday. So I had a look inside and yes, he was a Burma veteran. So I got in touch with the care home he was in and uh, set up a photo shoot. So he was absolutely terrific. He wasn't complaining, but he did just mention that he'd had to start using a walking stick to walk with. So there's hope for all of us, I think. He was in the Indian Army, the 17th Dogra Regiment. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is Sid Rattle. Um, dear Sid, he was 98 when I photographed him. He was in the Army Catering Corps. And I had a couple of uh, a couple of days before I was due to see him, I had a phone call from his daughter, Marilyn, to say that very unusually for him, he'd been really, really ill. Um, and quite honestly, she wasn't sure that he'd make it through to the to the date I was photographing him. Um, but he, he did, and I went to Western Supermare. He was in a care home as well, and the staff didn't seem to know much about the fact that I was meant to be there and were a little bit unsure that he was going to want to do it or be strong enough to do it but oh yes absolutely he was determined so they put a smart clean shirt on him he was still in bed but he was in the smart and he was absolutely wonderful and he talked and talked and talked um, a couple of times he stopped talking for rather longer than I was comfortable with and I thought I might have to call the staff but then he'd start up again uh, he, he was absolutely marvelous and his daughter phoned me uh, two days later to say that he passed away and she was convinced that he'd waited so that he could be part of the project. Um, th this uh, is an interesting image to me, I think, when, once you know who, who's in the picture. So in the foreground, um, we have the second Viscount Slim, uh, Colonel John Slim. He was the president of the Burma Star Association. Um, and had been out in Burma towards the end of the war. And his father behind him was Field Marshal William Bill Slim, who was the first Viscount Slim. He was known as Uncle Bill and he led the 14th Army. Um, so he had been absolutely key to the whole. Uh, oh, we've now got unlimited minutes. How about that? I can relax. Oh. Uh, that's really good. Um, and look at all the medals on his father. I just think what a reputation to follow. And I thought that picture rather illustrated that to me. Uh, I sent a photograph that I'd taken to each of the, the people that I photographed. Um, sometimes they had been with their partners. Sometimes they'd been uh, with a member of the family, quite understandably. Sometimes a, a son or a daughter or a niece or, or whatever would turn up to, to be there as a chaperone to make sure I was trustworthy. Um, this was the exception to everyone liking their picture. This is Ken Burton. Uh, he was in the flying boat corps. I think that's terribly dramatic. Um, and he didn't like that picture because his trousers were too saggy. Um, so I got a bit of a, a telling off for that. So I sent him another one. Um, this is the Reverend John Langdon. He, after the war, became um, an Anglican vicar. Um, he's 94 in this picture. And he commanded, he was in the Royal Marines, and he commanded the first wave of landing craft, putting British shoot troops ashore at Sword Beach on D-Day. The boat he was on did five crossings. On the fifth one, it was sunk by mines and he managed to save his Bible and his two tennis rackets, apparently, so I'm, so I'm told. Um, and after all that, he was sent to Burma. I mean, goodness me, things that people did. Um, uh, after he died, his niece got in touch with me. He'd never been married, he didn't have any children. You can see the picture of that woman um, behind him. And she rang up and she said, did he by any chance say who that woman was? because she had no idea. 
and I'm so annoyed I didn't ask him and he didn't tell me. That's my formal portrait of him. Um, that was used by the, uh, the Times in his obituary. And, and, and there are several sorts of uh, elements of the project that I wasn't expecting. Um, first of all, the importance that the project had to the veterans. I mean, you can, you can tell perhaps by the fact that somebody phoned me to say that, lots of people phoned me to say that their fathers had died. A lot of people used my photographs on the coffins at the funerals. I mean, you know, just unbelievable. Um, and a bit sad to keep hearing about these lovely people dying. Um, a lot of the connections have continued on and I'm um, having lunch with one of the veterans next week. I wasn't expecting that. Um, and then there was the responsibility of producing an outcome. And I know quite often with projects, projects sort of go on and on and on. This one I boundaried within the year. By chance, it was the 70th anniversary of VJ Day. I, I, it's not why I did it, but by chance. Um, and I was saying to me, well, they were asking me, what are you going to do with the pictures? What are you going to do with the pictures? So I said, oh, well, you know, there'll be a, an exhibition, maybe a book. And so, of course, I did, I did have to have an exhibition um, because I had said it so often. And I had to have an exhibition just as quickly as I possibly could so that as many who were able could come along and see it. And so I got in touch with the Army and Navy Club in Pall Mall, which was a very uh, logical place, although they had no gallery, we turned three of their rooms into a gallery. Um, and I had an exhibition that included every single veteran that I photographed, some of the memorabilia, and I had some photos on the wall, some in a photo book I had made that was like an old photo album that I'd seen, so many of them had, and I did a, an AV presentation. And this is a picture of my dad looking at the picture of him on the wall at that exhibition <laughs> with a lovely man, John Kelly, to, to his right. This year, being five years later from when I took those photos, um, as you probably know, is the 75th anniversary of VJ Day. Um, and VJ Day, victory against Japan, uh, over Japan, is the marking of the end of the war, not VE Day. And these two gentlemen I photographed during the project, and their images were used this year um, by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in association with the Royal British Legion. Um, so see if you can spot them in this next film, which is shorter than the first one. This is one of the things that was produced for this year's commemoration. Not by me.
and that was shown uh, on billboards around the country. And although this next picture doesn't show it at the point at which either of um, the, the pictures of the veterans that I put in were showing, um, that's one of the places that the film was shown, um, up in the, the curve in Piccadilly. So I'm tremendously excited about that, that I managed to get two of the veterans. Actually, I did know, I did photograph this particular veteran, but this wasn't my photograph that they used. But I was terribly thrilled that um, two of my veterans' pictures were up on the Piccadilly curve. So if anyone happened to be in Piccadilly Circus um, on the 15th of August this year and take any pictures, then let me know. Um, so that's it, really. Thank you very much for listening. So, th Wendy, just thank you so very much for this. And I just absolutely must say that every time when I see here um, anything that comes from Wendy, the only words that come to, to me is outstanding, wonderful, beautiful. The thorough approach that she takes to absolutely everything she does is absolutely breathtaking. And uh, the effort that... I should go the colour of my wall, Kate. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's okay, you will blend in. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, it's, it's, it really is. I, I'm just thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled by this. And uh, I also want to say that, of course, um, at a glance it just seems portraits and things, but to me it's much more than just about your personal projects as remembrance of your father and all these particular people. This is a project about resilience, the strength, and for me, most importantly, it is something about love because uh, we all seek love. That is, This is what we all want. And uh, people go to war to win. So then, then after that, they can actually carry on with their lives and um, love each other, hopefully, and uh, uh, raise their families. And um, Wendy, uh, I just uh, have a very quick question first. So which time are you showing this exhibition at the gallery? Because this is not the first time, isn't it? No, that's right. So I had the one in the Army and Navy Club, which I mentioned. Um, I had one which was actually initiated by one of the veterans themselves in Peterborough. And then I had an exhibition at the National Memorial Arboretum. Um, up in Staffordshire, if anyone know it, it's an absolutely fantastic place and uh, again a very appropriate place to, to have these images and during that exhibition we also borrowed some of the memorabilia pieces themselves from the veterans uh, which was a, a, a good dimension to add into it. Okay and we actually have a question from Anna Lenner uh, she wrote, uh, Wendy, when you're interviewing people, how do you decide, agree, what information to share about them? Well, I would say to each of them, after I talked to them and after I photographed them, of course I got them all to, to sign, um, <laughs> that I could use their images. And um, in terms of the text, it would just be, is there anything that you've told me that you wouldn't want me to share? Um, and I can only remember one particular gentleman who had been mentioned in dispatches, but he didn't want me to say that he'd been mentioned in dispatches. I mean, a lot of them were very, uh, very humble. And, uh, you know, they, they just were doing a job and they didn't want any sort of accolades or, you know, making them out to be heroes or anything like that. But he was the only person who actually said the um, sort of information that he'd been given. Obviously, I wouldn't give out addresses and things like that, but um, the, the sort of things that they told me. Okay, so there are also a few comments from uh, Sinead Hewson. Uh, thank you very much for sharing your work and insights with us. And from Naomi, wonderfully moving, um, fantastic images, Wendy. Um, and from Dan, uh, uh, how do you know when the project finishes? When do you stop looking for subjects? Yes, that, that is, it's always a good question, isn't it? When does the project finish? I started it in the March and I mentioned the fact that it was that year, the 70th anniversary year. So I thought that would be my boundary. So I would stop when the year stopped. And in fact, I had intended to stop at Christmas and you know, not go anywhere between Christmas and New Year, family time. But there was a veteran that I'd been trying to um, include in the project, 
because of his background, he had been part of the retreat. So he had been out in Burma before the Japanese came in. And it was the most horrendous pushing of people um, up out through through the country. He'd been part of that. And he got in touch and said, yes, you can come and photograph me. So it would have to be between Christmas and New Year. Um, he was in Scotland, so that was a bit unfortunate to have to do a trip for a, a single veteran. Um, but I had set out to photograph everyone that I found. So if I found them and they were willing to do it, which all but about three, I think, were, um, I photographed them. But that, that's when it stopped. And of course, I didn't find everyone. Of course, I didn't. Um, you know, I've come across people since who uh, I hadn't photographed, but that was that's what I had to do to know that the project was finished in terms of taking the, the photographs. In fact, there's a, a, a veteran who will probably come along to the exhibition um, who wasn't. I did contact him, but he never answered. And um, he, he's regretted ever since that he didn't take part in it. But when I had the exhibition at the Army and Navy Club, I had a a, a volunteer rotor of veterans who would be in the exhibition to talk to visitors. And, and he was probably the one who came along um, most. And uh, I saw him at the big commemoration that was on this uh, last month in August up at the National Memorial Arboretum. And he was there and he says he will get to the exhibition if he can. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Ian, can I say something? Please do. Uh, Wendy, I just want to add my congratulations on this project. It's absolutely wonderful. You must be very pleased. Um, Apart from it being an interesting subject, I mean, when I've been in the gallery a couple of times, I mean, when you were hanging and today, uh, I don't, I dismiss the Burma associations and I just judge the photography, which is also absolutely excellent. So whether these guys were in Burma or Timbuktu or wherever, you've done some marvellous portraits of them. So well done for that. Um, are the, is this exhibition going to be going into a national archive of some sort, do you know? I mean, are you going to donate it to the to some sort of you know, thing that goes on into the future? Um, that, that is yet to be determined. For the first exhibition, I had fund, some funding from the Burma Star Memorial Fund. Now, the Memorial Fund has been set up. In fact, the Burma Star Association closed this August and that, so now only the Burma Star Memorial Fund exists and they you know their raison d'etre is to keep the stories going and to, to, to have it remembered. Um, at some point maybe they could have the images but whether they'd have room to house them or not is another <laughs> is another question they take up a lot of space. Um, it would be very good if digitally they could perhaps be available in the Imperial War Museum um, yeah. or something of that nature. Um, I mean, you've put I, a lot of effort into this project <laughs> and you think, well, they need to, somebody needs to save it so that they can show it in 50 and 100 years time to other people. But uh, Yes, thank you. That would yeah. be lovely, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, the other thing I want to mention about Fred, he mentioned today that he started a job as a civil servant before he went to Burma and for the duration of his wartime in Burma, he was paid his civil service salary, which was better than army pay. So um, <laughs> he said it was the most wonderful, exciting period of his life. It was like a, a fantastic paid holiday, really. I mean, which is a strange thing to say. Um, and the thing, the other thing that looking at the exhibition that I really would like to know is what did these guys do for the following 70 years? Did they become insurance salesmen? Were they uh, art gallery curators? What did they do? With, you know, I would love to know that. Just totally across the board things that you might expect them to do. Really, they were, I mean, some, a few of them were military people and they stayed in the military for a while, but that was a very, very small number. Uh, but uh, just everything you can think of. Yes, insurance, yes, banking, um, yeah. printing, you know, anything you can think of really. And some of them were fairly well off and others were, well, 
there were three or four where the, the, the place that they lived in was so small, it was really difficult to get an environmental portrait because I could hardly get far enough away. I mean, you know, really, really um, a variety of different uh -huh. lives that they'd had since. And some people loved it there, um, you know, in the army. And some people absolutely hated it. Yeah. One last comment from me. I just want this exhibition to stay up for another six months. So, Kate, if you could arrange that, uh, I'd be very <laughs> grateful. <laughs> I absolutely can arrange that. Uh, maybe not straight away, yeah. but later, later on, if we have gaps, I would be very much well, interested in welcoming this exhibition yeah. back for a longer period, if yeah. when you would anyway. agree to that. Um, well oh, that's very kind, Ian. Thank you so much. That's really lovely from someone who's seen the work quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and we'll yeah. probably see it again before it comes down on Sunday. Yeah, I'll say that uh, with whoever I spoke to who did see it, this exhibition in real life, there were absolutely wonderful uh, comments and feedback. We have a question from Marco. Uh, hi, Wendy. Thank you very much. Fantastic work. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about your photography? When did you start and how? And do you have other projects in mind in the near future? Thank you. So, Wendy, can you tell us a bit more about your photography, please? Okay, great. Thank you for that. Thank you, Marco. Uh, I studied photography way back when, um, when universities were still polytechnics. Um, so, I've done photography for a long time, but I have taken huge gaps out. Um, for, for various reasons, one of which is to earn money to live, um, the other is to, to have a family. And every now and then I've gone back into it and then, you know, something has stopped it. But uh, about 12 years or so ago, I thought, okay, now is the time I've got to, to do this because it's what I've always wanted to, to do full time. Well, not full time. I still don't do it full time. I work part time to pay for my photography. Um, and um, your, your other question um, about well, if I have other projects in mind really links in beautifully to your um, nudge there, Anna. Thank you for uh, mentioning another project which I have finished in terms of taking the photographs, but I am currently working on a book, which will happen. Um, my father was often my inspiration um, and he died um, three years ago and um, I won't go into all the story, perhaps we'll have another exhibition <laughs> another time on that one, but I ended up portraying him by photographing all the things that he had, every everything that he had um, when he died. Not individually, I've got every staple, but I haven't got them individually, um, things are in groups, but that was a, another Label of labor of love. I mean, both of those projects are examples of where it was my gut that made me do the project. And I have to say, there's nothing better to, to be so driven that you have to do it. Um, it just so happened that, especially with the veterans, I absolutely love doing it. It would have been difficult if I, if I hadn't, but um, so uh, in the end, I took over 9,000 photographs, um, not all of which will be in my coming book, but there will be a book. So at some point there might be a plug for crowdfunding. I have to warn you here. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. That would be good. We have uh, not a question, but we have a, a very lovely touching comment from Anna. Uh, thinking of your tribute to your father, you don't do things by half. Uh, photographing <laughs> every object of his, photographing every veteran you could find. Really a loving and respectful tribute. I just can't agree more with that. Uh, Wendy, you're absolutely outstanding. I'm thrilled by the quality of anything that you produce. Um, also, uh, a question from Natalie. Uh, hello, Wendy. Uh, many thanks for the talk and telling us about this wonderful project. I'm always interested in what camera. Ah, I'm always interested in what camera uh, photographer to use. Is there one that you mostly use? So it's about the okay. Camera. Thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Thank you, Natalie. Um, if I'm working digitally, I'm a Nikon person. Sorry to all those Canon or Fuji people. Um, but I don't always shoot digitally. I've got projects that I do analog. And um, sometimes that's on a Hasselblad. And because for a while they became really cheap and I could finally buy one. Um, 
and I also use um, a Lomo camera as well for some really low low tech work. Um, but for this project and for the big project of my father's things, it had to be digital. I couldn't I couldn't go back, couldn't make mistakes, um, and also couldn't afford the film and the processing. So it's a Nikon. Okay. Anybody else has any comments or questions? Um, okay, so I also want to uh, make my own uh, comment that uh, uh, another thing that I really liked about this project is, or something that we see on the walls, is that every frame is handmade and purposefully made for this particular project. And how many photographers do that? This is outstanding also. And Wendy, I just want to ask you about your choice of um, perhaps paper and uh, you don't have glass as well on your photographs. No, the frames, I didn't make the frames, but they are really, really lovely. Um, and I'm very, very pleased with them. When we put glass, over the photographs and I can't honestly I can't remember I'm not very good at remember technical things I can't remember what the paper is but I took a lot of care choosing the paper that they were printed on and immediately we put glass in front of them it killed them there was no point in going to all that trouble they're beautifully printed again not by me um, and to put glass on them just lost all of the the, 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 the beauty that the paper had um, also, glass is really expensive um, and heavy, so it was great. Decision easily made, no glass, except, um, so those of you who've been to the exhibition will see that it's broken down a little bit in sections. Um, and there's one section which is uh, pictures of memorabilia in dark, dark frames and they're set away from the back. So they look a little bit more like the object rather than a photograph of the object. And they have got museum glass over them because I really, really wanted people to, people to be able to see that. And they did need glass because they're not on the same paper. Um, so, yeah, if you're going to, for me, again, the responsibility of getting it right for those wonderful, wonderful people. Um, I had to do it. I had to do it properly. Um, I, there is just one other thing I should say, which is that in Burma, the majority of the people on the Allied side were not actually British. I mean, most of them were Indian, from the Indian Army. We, we, you know, we were in charge of India at that time. We sent sent a lot of Indians in. A lot of people, a lot of people died. Um, and there were Australians and Africans and all different nations. The people that I found in this country five years ago were pretty much the British people. And I didn't have enough money to go around India. So, but I think it's important to say that because the pictures are the portraits of those people, but they're not representative of who was out there at the time. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. So we have a, a very nice comment from Richard. Very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> yeah. And Anna, Anna's comment says, you show a lot of care and consideration in your work. Also a sense of uh, cataloging and documenting what's important. Um, it is indeed. And uh, I also want to add that uh, you didn't just uh, uh, took extra effort uh, to produce the frames and uh, to produce this wonderful selection of prints, but also how you arranged uh, things in the gallery. You put a lot of thought into it. And I, I wish I could take the credit for curating this exhibition, but unfortunately I can't because the, it's 100% Wendy's cura curatorial work as well. And the one comment I, want, I have to, to make is that you have a wonderful bamboo uh, hanging uh, at the top of one wall and then a long strip of paper uh, with the largest photograph. And um, this is something more than just a photograph in the frame. This is uh, something tangible. Um, tell us please about that. Uh, okay, thank you for those comments. I think you do need to take quite a lot of credit because without your um, skill and expertise, probably none of those pictures would be hanging straight. <laughs> um, 
because I may have determined in the main where they went, but without you, yeah, anyway, so you did a great job. Thank you so much for your help in, in, in hanging the exhibition. Um, with that first exhibition that I talked about, the space was so huge um, that I had to be able to keep people's interest as they walk around it. So there had to be variety. So um, one of the things I did was one person's memorabilia was a, a Japanese flag that I photographed on that person's carpet. That person's carpet was a very swirly, um, dare I say, the sort of carpet that is primarily in the homes of, of people who are perhaps of an of a older generation. I may, I may be doing other people a disservice, but that was patently what it was. And I had that blown up really, really big on canvas. And that was on the wall directly opposite the door. So that was, you know, a, to draw people in, gave something to people to look at. It was a little bit controversial, apparently, to put up the Japanese flag. But as it was a captured flag, I think that was OK. Um, and and so the rest of that room also had to be broken down into sections. So we had a se section where I had the walls. Um, we put up fake walls around the, the room were painted yellow and on that went the photographs of the Karen people that I photographed out in uh, Myanmar. Uh, another section, I took one of the landscapes that I photographed, I had it made into a huge sort of wallpaper that was up, that had some black and whites on. So the, the Kozo paper was part of that as well to, you know, to vary it because otherwise it, it you know, it could get tiresome. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. We are actually nearing to the end of our session, so we probably have about three to five minutes left. And uh, thanks again to you, Wendy, and to everyone who has participated today and is participating still. And does anyone have any comments, questions uh, before we close the session? Uh, could I just say, it's Richard here. Um, I work for Age UK and have done for that last 10 years and prior to that I used to be the visitor in care homes so I'm very familiar with uh, older adults coming to the end of their lives and it being important to document uh, if they want to something about uh, the kind of life that they've led and to possibly illustrate it with photography and I just think there's you know above and beyond this particular project there are so many others that could be taken up and I think that there could be links forged to care homes, residential homes, uh, and people could really make inroads into documenting people's lives mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on, a, on a regular basis, because um, that's part of my job. I've had mm -hmm. to do life stories for people. And it's amazing who you come across. You, you know there's a lady who do, who's good at crosswords, and it turns out she was a code breaker working in Kent at one of the listening stations. Mm -hmm. uh, other people, uh, were running across Blackheath and there was a doodle bug flying along beside them um, before it landed. You know, it's just incredible what, what can come out from uh, everybody's life story, whether it was they were in the war or not. Yes. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out there because it, it, it's just so poignant, the result from, from looking at all those people's lives. Yeah, there you go. No, I, I, everybody has a story. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure if you're doing life stories with people um, in care homes, you know, it's part of the, well, I was going to say therapeutic, it is therapeutic, but it's also part of them sharing stories that, that may be lost otherwise. Yes. Um, and I have to say that a lot of veterans hadn't spoken to anyone until they were, you know, of an age. And then it was often the grandchildren. They often never spoke to their children at the end of the war they were given a letter to say they mustn't speak to anyone about it i hear on the radio yeah. sometimes people saying but they never talked about it and it's like well because they were told not to and one yes. or two people said that to me and i said it's okay 70 years later i think you're all right to do that now yeah. but it yeah all those lost stories from people who who, who died you know and, and didn't have their stories captured. Although I have to say, you know, the Imperial War Museum, National Memorial Arboretum, and places like that, um, and the Burma Star Association for Burma have tried to, to capture a lot of stories, um, mm, either yeah. spoken or written. But yes, it doesn't have to be war related, Richard, does it? It really doesn't. 
And we have a comment from Sinead. I agree, Richard. I'm originally from Ireland. The Museum of Country Life was established to document lives and memories of lost traditions. There is a similar initiative in the Netherlands which documents daily life and bigger mm. stories too. Yeah. Yeah, so anybody who's good with the camera could be a big part of all that, I think. Well, yeah. it could be a start of a rather interesting and larger movement. Potentially. We can and get a project yes. going, Richard. Possibly so. And uh, we today we have touched so many different aspects of things and we could carry on and go on and on and on just uh, uh, unveiling more and more each of the avenues and uh, what uh, this only is being enabled because the project is really really deep and uh, is done to a very high standard and I only wish that uh, this is something uh, to aim for in the photographer's um, world and also in particularly in the camera club and I'm sure that we have so many uh, people who can also keep up with Wendy <laughs> And uh, and uh, anything else anybody else wants to say at the in the last few minutes that we have left? No, I just want to say thank you to Wendy again for all the effort, and I've really enjoyed seeing it. Thanks again. very much, Ian. Thank you, and thanks uh, everybody, yeah. and especially yeah, thank, thank you, yeah, thank you Wendy. Thanks thank a lot. Nice to meet so many of you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.